Atut terakhir. Israel and Hezbollah exchange heavy fire in major escalation. Philippines and China trade blame after a new South China Sea collision. Good afternoon and Salam Alisi Madani. This is World Today. I'm Mohna Priya. Israel has launched airstrikes into Lebanon, saying it destroyed thousands of Hezbollah rocket launchers and thwarted a major attack, while the Lebanese group insisted it had been able to deliver a drone and a rocket barrage of its own. The result was perhaps the biggest exchange of fire in 10 months of Gaza war and has triggered both new violence in the Lebanon-Israel border and fears of a broader conflagration in West Asia. The Israeli military said around 100 of its fighter jets has struck more than 270 targets, 90 percent of which were short-range rockets aimed at northern Israel. Hezbollah, the powerful Iran-backed Lebanese armed group, denied that thousands of launches had been destroyed or that Israel had thwarted a larger attack. It said its own operation was completed and accomplished. Hezbollah said it launched a large number of drones and more than 320 Katyusha rockets targeting enemy positions across the border. Hezbollah has traded a near daily cross-border fire with Israeli forces throughout the Gaza war. Fears of a wider regional conflagration soared after attacks in late July blamed on Israel killed Iran-aligned group leaders, including the Hamas political chief and a top Hezbollah commander, Fuad Shukr, which prompted vows of revenge. On a related note, dozens of passengers at Lebanon's only international airport were anxiously checking announcement boards as more flights to the capital were cancelled or delayed amid escalating hostilities between Israel and Hezbollah. Beirut International Airport was functioning, but many passengers were stuck as major airlines announced flight suspensions after Israel and Hezbollah engaged in broad strikes in an escalation of cross-border hostilities. Air France and its subsidiary Transavia said they were suspending flights to Beirut and Tel Aviv scheduled for yesterday and today, adding that the move could be extended depending on the situation in West Asia. Royal Jordanian Airlines also announced the suspension of Beirut flights due to the current situation. The UAE's Etihad Airways said it had also cancelled its services yesterday to and from Beirut and Tel Aviv. Lebanon's Civil Aviation Authority emphasised that the airport was functioning normally despite some disruptions. It noted there is no truth to rumours that all flights had been cancelled. A number of airlines had already announced a flight suspensions or cancellations to Beirut in recent weeks, with some later resuming services. Meanwhile, Gazans and patients were forced to leave Al-Aqsa Hospital in Deir al-Bala and move to the nearby areas following Israeli army evacuation orders. Palestinians said the new evacuation orders will impact the area close to Al-Aqsa Hospital, which serves hundreds of thousands of Palestinians currently overcrowding the central Gaza areas. Families were moving with what they can carry to the nearby places. In the last 24 hours, at least 71 people were killed and 112 injured in what Gaza Health Ministry called three massacres by Israel in the Gaza Strip. The ministry stated that at least 40,405 Palestinians have been killed and 93,468 others injured in Israel's military offensive in Gaza since the 7th of October last year. 
China's Coast Guard said it rescued Filipino personnel who fell overboard after a Philippine vessel collided with one of its ships near a disputed shoal in the South China Sea. The Philippines slammed China's claims as completely unfounded. Beijing accused the Philippine vessel of deliberately colliding with a Chinese Coast Guard ship. It said the collision took place near the disputed Sabina Shoal, 140 kilometers west of the Philippine island of Palawan, and about 1,200 kilometers from Hainan Island, the closest Chinese landmass. China Coast Guard spokesman Gan Yu said the collision occurred when a Philippine vessel refused to comply with control measures after attempting to deliver supplies to another vessel stationed near the Xianbin Reef in the Nansha Islands. The Philippines, meanwhile, said that its ships encountered aggressive and dangerous maneuvers from the Chinese side when they were on a humanitarian mission to resupply Filipino fishermen with diesel, food and medical items. It said the Chinese vessels made close, perilous maneuvers that resulted in ramming, blasted horns and deployed water cannons, leading to an early termination of the resupply operation after their ship experienced engine failure. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un oversaw a performance test of suicide drones developed in the country recently. Now, the leader also inspected the construction sites of various North Korean industrial factories on Saturday and Sunday. On Saturday, Kim visited the Drone Institute of North Korea's Academy of Defense Sciences and viewed a successful test of drones correctly identifying and destroying designated targets after flying along different preset routes. According to Korean Central News Agency, Kim called for the production of more suicide drones to be used in tactical infantry and special operation units such as underwater suicide attack drones, as well as strategic reconnaissance and multi-purpose attack drones. It further reported that Kim also called for more tests on the drones' combat application to equip North Korean military with them as early as possible. Pyongyang has ramped up its tactical warfare capabilities involving short-range missiles and heavy artillery that aimed at striking the south after having made advances in longer-range ballistic missile and nuclear programs. Reuters safety advisor who was covering the Ukraine war died after a missile strike on a hotel in the eastern Ukrainian city of Kramatorsk. Now the strike also injured two of its journalists. Reuters said in a statement that Ryan Evans was killed after a missile struck the Hotel Sapphire where he was staying as part of a six-person team on Saturday. Evans, a former British soldier, had been working as a safety advisor with Reuters since 2022 and advised its journalists on safety around the world, including in Ukraine, Tel Aviv and the Paris Olympics. Reuters was not able to independently verify if the missile that hit the hotel was fired by Russia or if it was a deliberate strike on that building. Two of the agency's journalists were being treated in hospital, with one of them seriously injured. Ukrainian prosecutors said the hotel was hit by a Russian Iskander missile, with the strike also damaging the building next door. Kramatorsk, the last major city under Ukrainian control in the Donetsk region, is often used as a base for aid workers and foreign journalists. Still ahead, at least 36 dead and two Pakistan bus crashes. At least 36 people were killed in two separate bus accidents in Pakistan, including 12 people who had been trying to reach Iran. All 24 people on board a bus were killed when it plunged into a ravine near the town of Azad Patan on the border between Punjab province and Pakistan-administered Kashmir. Around 20 villagers helped to retrieve the bodies before officials arrived. In a separate incident, at least 12 men died when their bus crashed into a ravine on the Makran coastal highway in Baluchistan after being prevented from crossing into Iran. An army crane helped to remove the bus from the ravine and no further bodies or wounded people were found. 
The accident occurred in a mountainous area around 100 kilometers from the nearest town of Uthal and 500 kilometers from the Iran border town of Pishin. The bus was carrying Pakistanis on its way to Iran, but was turned back at the border because their documents had some problems. Road accidents with high fatalities are common in Pakistan, where safety measures are lax, driver training is poor, and the transport infrastructure often decrepit. French judicial authorities have extended the detention of the founder and chief of Telegram, Pavel Durov, following his arrest at a Paris airport over alleged offences related to the popular but controversial messaging app. His arrest at the Le Bourget airport outside Paris late Saturday is the latest extraordinary twist in the career of one of the world's most influential tech icons. The detention of Durov was extended beyond Sunday night by the investigating magistrate who is handling the case. The initial period of detention for questioning can last up to a maximum of 96 hours. When this phase of detention ends, the judge can then decide to free him or press charges and remand in further custody. Durov was arrested on an arrest warrant as part of a preliminary police investigation focusing on a lack of moderators on Telegram. Police considered that this situation allowed criminal activities such as fraud, drug trafficking and cyberbullying to go on undeterred on the messaging app. Telegram meanwhile said in response that Durov had nothing to hide and travels frequently in Europe. It said Telegram abrides by EU laws, including the Digital Services Act, adding that its moderation is within industry standards. Australia gave millions of workers the right, the legal right, to disconnect, allowing them to ignore unreasonable out-of-hours contact from employers to the distress of big industry. People can now refuse to monitor, read or respond to their employer's attempts to contact them outside working hours, unless that refusal is deemed unreasonable. The law is similar to those of some European and Latin American countries. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese hailed the reform pushed through by his centre-left Labour government. The law, enacted in February, came into force for medium-sized and large companies as of today. Smaller companies with fewer than 15 employees will be covered from 26th August next year. Under the law, workers may be ordered by a tribunal to stop unreasonably refusing out-of-hours contact, and employers likewise may be ordered to stop unreasonably requiring employees to respond. The Fair Work Ombudsman said the question of what is reasonable will depend on the circumstances. Deciding factors may include the reason for the contact, the nature of the employee's role and their compensation for working extra hours or being available. France introduced the right to disconnect in 2017, hoping to tackle the always-on culture facilitated by smartphones and other digital devices. Meanwhile, a horror incident involving at least six victims has unfolded on a Sydney road in Australia with a cop stabbed during the rampage yesterday. All the victims were taken to hospital after the incident, including the man suspected of carrying out the wild attack. Police said no one was killed in the attack, which came after a domestic-related incident in a car that collided with another vehicle in the southern suburb of Engadin. They added that the attacker was armed with a box cutter and was taken into custody, suffering self-inflicted wounds. Sydney, a city of around 5 million people, has seen a spate of knife attacks this year, prompting the New South Wales government to toughen its knife laws. The state parliament passed laws in June giving police electronic metal detecting scanners to check people without a warrant at shopping centres, sporting venues and public transport stations. Elsewhere, German police were holding a 26-year-old Syrian man in custody after a knife attack in the city of Solingen, in which three people were killed and eight injured. They said they were looking into the suspect's possible links with the Daesh group. 
The incident, along with Daesh Group's claim of responsibility, sparked concern among some politicians who urged enhanced security, tighter curbs on weapons, stiffer punishment for violent crimes and limits to immigration. The attack occurred during a festival on Friday evening in a market square where live bands were playing to celebrate Solingen's 650-year history. Düsseldorf police and prosecutors said in a joint statement that the suspect turned himself in late on Saturday and admitted to the crime. He came from a home for refugees in Solingen that was searched on the same day. German federal prosecutors identified the Syrian man as Issa al Hitch, omitting his family name because of German privacy laws and said he was suspected of being a member of the Daesh group. According to the local media, the suspect arrived in Germany in December 2022 and had a protected immigration status, often given to those fleeing war-torn Syria. At least 13 people have been killed and six were missing in Indonesia's North Maluku province after floods hit the east of the sprawling archipelago, damaging homes and burying people in mud. Using excavators, the search and rescue workers dug out several bodies from the mud in the early hours of yesterday morning. The country's disaster management agency, BNPB, said the floods were caused by heavy rain since Saturday and warned residents to remain vigilant, citing forecasts of more heavy rain to come in the next few days. It warned local residents to be on guard. BNPB also stated that it had deployed a team to help evacuate the victims. Search and rescue agency Basarnas also said that efforts to evacuate the victims who were hit by landslides and debris swept along by floodwaters were ongoing. Around 1,000 personnel from a joint team have been involved in the search and rescue mission, including soldiers, police officers, local rescue workers, disaster agency staff and volunteers from various institutions. The operation is planned to continue for seven days but could be extended if necessary. In May, flash floods and mudslides in Indonesia's West Sumatra province killed more than 60 people. <laughs> And over in Bangladesh, river waters in low-lying areas are receding after days of deadly floods. But around 300,000 people are still in emergency shelters requiring aid. The heavy floods, which killed at least 18 people in Bangladesh, have added to the challenges of a new government that took charge this month after a student-led revolution. Rescue teams, including joint forces of the Army, Air Force and Navy, are helping those forced from their homes and bringing aid to those who have lost everything. The Disaster Management Ministry said that more than 307,000 people are in shelters and more than 5.2 million have been affected by the floods. The ministry said it is working to restore communications in the affected areas so that it can distribute relief food to the people. Monsoon rains cause widespread destruction yearly, but climate change is shifting weather patterns and increasing the number of extreme weather events. The floods add to the woes of a nation still reeling from weeks of political turmoil that culminated in the toppling of autocratic leader Sheikh Hasina, who fled to India by helicopter. She was replaced by Nobel Peace Prize laureate Mohamed Yunus, who is heading an interim government that faces the monumental task of charting democratic reforms ahead of expected new elections. Brazil was deploying military aircraft as part of a war against wildfires ravaging the southeastern state of Sao Paulo, with authorities warning that arsonists were setting blazes. The military aircraft being deployed includes a KC-390 Embraer, a converted troop transport craft that can drop up to 12,000 litres of water on fire zones. The Embraer was sent to one of the community's most threatened, Ribeirão Preto, a city of 700,000 residents, about 300 kilometres from Sao Paulo. With dense smoke drifting across a wide swath of Brazil, even reaching capital city Brasilia, 720 kilometers to the north, several flights have been cancelled and travel on some roads has been halted. Around the region, farm fields have burned and scores of cattle have died. 
Following a crisis meeting of President Luis Inácio Lula da Silva's cabinet, Environment Minister Marina Silva announced a war against the fires and said federal police were investigating the atypical situation that has caused extensive damage. Lula said so far, the authorities have not detected any fire caused by lightning, which means there are people starting the fires. The president promised federal assistance to the states in fighting the blazes, saying there were already 3,000 firefighters working nationwide. The ongoing armed conflict, relentless floods and a surge in deadly diseases induced by the floods are further exacerbating the humanitarian crisis in Sudan. The plight broke out after clashes between the Sudanese armed forces and the rival rapid support forces erupted in April last year. Since June, the floods have claimed the lives of at least 114 people and injured 281 others, with over 110,000 individuals affected. The disaster also led to a breakdown of essential services in many areas already crippled by more than a year of armed conflict. The situation has also triggered a hike in deadly diseases such as cholera, malaria and dengue. The torrential rains have damaged vital infrastructure, including bridges and roads. Water supply, drainage and waste management systems have collapsed, creating a breeding ground for diseases. The Ministry of Health confirmed that cholera has spread rapidly due to contamination of drinking water. Adding to the chaos, over 10 million people have been displaced by the ongoing conflict, forced to live in makeshift camps or on the streets. Up in sports, a Real Madrid win, but Mbappe fires Bernabeu Blacks. Kicking off our sports segment with football. Spanish champions Real Madrid earned a 3-0 win over Real Valladolid in La Liga as Kylian Mbappe made his Santiago Bernabeu bow without finding the net. Real Valladolid set out to frustrate the champions in the summer heat and succeeded for 45 minutes. Madrid came out with more bite in the second half and midfielder Federico Valverde smashed home a vicious low free kick with the help of a deflection to break the deadlock. Mbappe blew a golden opportunity to get off the mark when Vinicius Jr. cut the ball across to him, but Estonian goalkeeper Karl Hein saved well. The France captain had another chance on the counter-attack, but fired wide before being replaced by 18-year-old Brazilian forward Endrick. Brahim Diaz secured Madrid's win with a neat lobbed finish and then teed up Endrick, who drilled home at the near post to celebrate his first appearance for the club in style. Still lacking fluency in attack, Carlo Ancelotti's side stayed two points behind rivals Barcelona, who beat Athletic Bilbao on Saturday. Meanwhile, Antoine Griezmann, Marcos Lorente and Koke strikes helped Diego Simeone's Atletico claim their first win of the campaign against Girona. Julian Alvarez started for the Rojiblancos at their Metropolitano Stadium, while new arrival Conor Gallagher made his debut as a substitute after joining from Chelsea. The hosts had control of the game as Mikel Sanchez Girona, who finished the third ahead of the fourth-placed Atletico last term, struggled to make an impact. Griezmann put Atletico ahead shortly before the interval with a hard and low free kick which caught goalkeeper Paulo Gaziniga out. Lorente increased the lead early in the second half with a thunderbolt from outside the area which flashed into the roof of the net. Koke wrapped up Atletico's win on the counter-attack in stoppage time when Lorente put the ball on a plate for him to finish. Diego Simeone's side reached four points after a two-all draw at Villarreal in their league opener. Girona, who lost uh, several key players in the summer, have only one point from their first two matches. And moving on to tennis, Linda Noskova gave herself a huge boost ahead of the U.S. Open as she claimed her first WTA Tour title with a 7-6-6-4 victory over Lulu Sun in the final of the Monterey Open. 
The Czech will number 35, who upset American second seed Emma Navarro in the semifinals, avenge her Cincinnati first-round loss at the hands of Sun two weeks ago, ahead of a U.S. Open first-round clash with 31st-ranked Yulia Putin-Selva on Wednesday morning. Noskova got off to a solid start, breaking Sun's first service game, only for the New Zealander to break back to maintain parity to force a tie-break. The 19-year-old Noskova then saved two set points before clinching the opening set in over an hour. In the second set, Noskova capitalized on the New Zealander's unforced errors to break her serve again and hold a key advantage that secured her triumph in one hour, 58 minutes in the northern Mexican city. Armand Duplantis and Jacob Inger Britson thrilled the spectators as they set world records at the Celestia Diamond League meeting. Duplantis celebrated in his usual exuberant style as he set a new mark of 6.25 metres in the pole vault less than three weeks after he last broke it when defending his Olympic title in Paris. He broke the world record for the 10th time, beating the 6.25 metres he cleared when retaining his Olympic gold medal in Paris. Now, this was also the third time this year he had broken his own record. The 24-year-old Swede was congratulated by Polish President Andrzej Duda who came onto the track and shook his hand. In the 3,000 metres, Inga Brixen, who lost his 1,500 metre Olympic crown but won the 5,000 metres title, held his hands to his face in astonishment. Then on top of his head, mouth agape after posting a time of 7 minutes, 17.55 seconds. The 23-year-old Norwegian smashed Kenyan Daniel Komen's 28-year-old mark by more than 3 seconds. Three days ago, the Norwegian had exacted a small measure of revenge over American Cole Hawker by winning the men's 1,500 metres in Lausanne in 3 minutes, 27.83 seconds, two weeks after Hawker shocked the Olympic field to win gold in Paris. And on to cycling, Britain's Adam Yates went all alone to win stage nine of the Vuelta a España as Australian Ben O'Connor finished third and held on to his overall lead. The British UAE team Emirates rider went solo 58 kilometres from the finish in the Sierra Nevada mountains. He crossed the line 1 minute 39 seconds ahead of Richard Carapaz, who also put himself back in contention with a superb ride. Yates' victory was some welcome good news for UAE after their rider Joao Almeida abandoned the race in the morning after testing positive for COVID-19. The Portuguese struggled on Saturday and fell off the pace in the overall standings. Australian Ben O'Connor retained the red jersey and increased his lead on second place to Primoz Roglic to 3 minutes 53 seconds by claiming four bonus seconds as he finished third on the 178.5 kilometre run from Montreal to Granada. Ecuadorian EF Education Easy Post rider Carapaz moved to third overall, trailing the leader by just over four and a half minutes, heading into today's rest day after making a stunning attack from the Peloton to catch the break. After today's rest day, stage 10 tomorrow will be a 160-kilometer ride from the Pontiarias to Bayona, another mountain stage. And that wraps up World Today. In our top story today, Israel and Hezbollah exchange heavy fire in major escalation. Tune in to Malaysia tonight coming up at 8.30 p.m. on TV1 and Saluran Berita RTM. Malaysia Madani, Jiwa Merdeka. I'm Mohna Priya. Thank you for your company.